Hey friends, welcome back to the Hearing Jesus Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Grohl. Today we are continuing our devotional reading through the Gospels with Matthew chapter 3. We're going to be breaking down this chapter into two pericopes. That's essentially two different thoughts that are included in the same passage. And we're doing that just so we can have a better understanding of each section. So today we're going to be reading Matthew 3, 1 through 6, and I'm reading from the NASB Bible. I've been reading from the NIV for the last couple days, but just a quick word about translations. Don't get caught up on that. Use whatever translation feels comfortable for you. I tend to lean towards the New American Standard Bible because it's the closest that I have found and what many scholars believe to be thought for thought and translation for translation to the original text. And so that's what I choose most often. But but I do use other translations and you're welcome to use whatever version works best for you. I always say the best translation is the one that you're going to read consistently. Matthew 3, verse 1. Now in those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, The voice of one calling out in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make his path straight. Now John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. At that time, Jerusalem was going out to him and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. This is a pretty short passage today, but I think there's a lot packed in here that I want to make sure we don't miss. And if I'm quite honest, when I have read this in the past and even the first couple of times I read it, you know, when I was a younger believer, I kind of just skimmed by it because I thought, man, this guy's kind of wacko sounding. He's wandering around the wilderness, you know, he's eating bugs and honey and just didn't quite understand what all it meant. And if I'm perfectly honest, you know, my daughter is a student at Penn State University, and many people know main campus. Every Everybody seems familiar with the fact that there's like this preacher guy that stands out in front of, I think it's the hub down there, that it just yells into a megaphone, similar things like prepare the way for the Lord, repent, the kingdom of God is coming. And he has a little bit of a reputation, so much so that many students even if they're curious about the gospel, they kind of like shy away from him because he's so intense. And I think if I'm honest, there's been a lot of times where I have read this passage and I've thought about that Penn State preacher. I've just thought like, how is this effective? But yet we know that Matthew includes it for a reason. And I think if we literally go through and see what the cultural and historical references were in this passage, we're going to come away with a different feeling than we might initially have had. At least I did. And I hope that that's helpful for you. So to begin with, in chapter three, we're now looking at Jesus as an adult. You'll remember in the last couple of days, last couple of chapters, we talked about the birth narrative, and then we talked about Jesus as a toddler. But now at this point, more than 25 years have passed since Joseph and his family arrived in Nazareth. And so Matthew is now describing the events that are leading up to this public ministry of Jesus. And Matthew talks about how this ministry of John the Baptist is preparing the way for the ministry of Jesus. And so what we start to see in chapter three are some of the key themes that are going to be key elements, not just in the book of Matthew, but in the general ministry of Jesus. Themes like repentance and the warning of coming judgment and the inclusion of the Gentiles, the non-Jews in God's kingdom. And so this short passage of, of six, six verses is starting to introduce some of these key themes. It's the way that Matthew is introducing them. So first and foremost, I want to talk a minute about the location. It says, now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. So the location is the Judean desert, the wilderness, and it's most likely in the area lower in the Jordan River Valley and in the hills west of the Dead Sea. And in this passage, John is referred to as being from the wilderness. And that's an important point I want to make sure that we don't miss. The idea of desert wilderness is an important piece of Israel's history. It's where they received the law. 
It's where the prophets got their revelation from God. It's where the Maccabeans that we just talked about last week or earlier this week, it's where they fought. It's also where there's this expectation of deliverance from the Messiah, because we see that in the Old Testament, that there was a deliverance from, from the wilderness into the promised land. And so also in this area, there was a group of people called the Qumrans and the Qumran caves, which you may have heard of, those were where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And so there is another community of people that are living in this same area. Now, there are some people who believe that John may have been part of that Qumran cave, that Qumran community, because there's some similarities between them. But, and we're going to point those out here in a minute, but there's enough of a difference between John and the Qumran community, that it's most likely that he was not part of that community. He was most likely aware of them. I think everybody in that time frame was aware of them, but he wasn't part of them. And the main reason we know why is because of John's message. John's message is calling for the entire nation of Israel to repent. The Qumrans, in contrast, focused on isolation. So John's message was more similar to the Old Testament prophets and the way that they called people to repentance. That was He was much more similar to them than he was the Qumrans. And so the similarities that we see, and as I explain these, hopefully you'll understand that, they were more of a reflection of the Jewish culture and the time frame than an actual connection between John and the Qumran people. There is an illusion to new deliverance from the wilderness in scripture. And what Matthew is doing is he's referring back to the books of Hosea and Isaiah, which are two Old Testament books of the prophets, which are current readers, the readers that would have been reading Matthew for the first time they knew about, they understood, they remembered, even though we may not. But what that did is it predicted in those books, a new exodus in the wilderness. So in this time frame, the Jewish people recognize the wilderness as a place where renewal movements would happen. So my first initial thought of this crazy guy being from the wilderness, we recognize that that was intentional on the part of John. It was symbolic and it was a metaphor of this understanding of this Messiah and what he was going to do for his people. The second thing I want to bring up is this word repent. And the idea of repentance, which you may already be familiar with, but but I want to make sure in case you're not, the idea of repentance is to change your mind and to also have this total change of thought and behavior. So in the Greek context, which remember the Old Testament is largely written in Hebrew, the New Testament is largely written in Greek. In the Greek context, it, it was the mind that was the ultimate center of a person's being. In the Hebrew, that word for repentance meant to turn or change directions, but in your ideas towards God, which then, of course, would impact behavior and direction. Either way, both of these concepts are referring to this total transformation of somebody, and it's essentially talking about this idea of conversion. The other thing that's brought up in verse two is the phrase kingdom of heaven. And if you've listened to the last couple of days, you'll know, and I talked about this before, that that phrase kingdom of heaven is often a substitute for the phrase kingdom of God, which we see elsewhere in the gospels. And remember, Matthew is talking to a Jewish audience. The Jewish people would not say the name of God out loud because they found that to be really irreverent. It was an act of blasphemy for that. And so what happens is many believers, current readers today, mistake that phrase, that kingdom of heaven phrase to mean the afterlife. But that's not what it's talking about here. It's talking about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are the same thing. And so what it's referring to as the kingdom of God is it's meaning this rule and reign of God that is breaking forth in that present moment, not just what's to come, but what's happening right then. And remember, John is telling people like, get ready because God is coming. He's coming on the scene. We are at the precipice of, of God's rule and reign here on, on earth. And so it refers to this messianic age where God's rule is coming to this fulfillment, or in other words, the arrival of the long awaited Messiah. <music> 
So this brings us to this idea that we see throughout the Gospels, this idea of the already, not yet. And perhaps you have felt that tension as a believer in a culture that is consumed by sin. On one hand, we already know that Jesus died on the cross. He rose again. He sent the Holy Spirit to empower us to live in this world as believers. But yet, the kingdom of God has not been fully realized. And so we live in this tension of knowing that it's already happened, but it's not yet happened. And that's something that we're going to see throughout, not just the gospels, but through the entire New Testament. And so it's really this first introduction of this tension that we always feel. They felt it back then and we feel it today, this already not yet. And I think it's important because I think sometimes we can get complacent as believers. We just either give up and we think, okay, well, it's just never going to happen within my lifetime. The kingdom isn't going to come in my lifetime. So why should I bother telling people about Jesus? or we get to this place where we can feel so frustrated that it hasn't happened yet. And I think part of our role is, as we learn to know God and to make him known is to help others understand how to live with that tension. And I think it also gives us a lot of hope. I want to jump down to verse four for a second. Verse four is the one that I think throws a lot of people. It says, John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and honey. Well, to us, that sounds weird because we are not from the first century Jewish culture. But what we have to realize is biographers, and Matthew is essentially writing a biography about Jesus, biographers normally only described their subject's appearance if they had a good reason to do that. So notice that Matthew describes John's appearance, but he doesn't describe Jesus's appearance. There's a reason for that. John's location, his clothes, his diet, they all are suggestive of being a servant of God. And I'm going to break that down. It's odd to us, but it would not have been odd to them. It would have made sense to them. It would have been a clue to them, those original audience members, to understanding that this is an indication of God's servant, one of God's servants. The first is the camel hair and the leather belt. Now, initially, this is an allusion to the prophet Elijah. So we read about that in 2 Kings chapter 1, and I'm going to read it. It says, verse 8, he was a hairy man and he wore a leather belt around his waist. That's talking about Elijah. It's a descriptor of Elijah. And so when he's when Matthew's talking about this camel hair coat and this leather belt, he's referring back to the symbolism between John the Baptist and the prophet Elijah. What does that mean? Well, in this time frame, you have to remember that even clothing, the clothing that they wore had significance. So you may remember hearing from other places in the Bible about sackcloth, literally the, the cloth that was part of the sack of grain or the sack of, of supplies would be turned into clothing, which was an indication of self-affliction. Sometimes they wore it during mourning, or sometimes they did it when they were repenting from a certain sin. That's one example of the significance of clothing. Another is what John is wearing. So goat or camel hair was often wove into this thick, rough cloth, and that was used as this outer garment, this cloak. And it was especially worn by people living in the desert. It was really, really dense and it was basically waterproof. But many scholars agree that this was a mark of intentional poverty. So think about that. John is wearing clothing that is an indication to the Jewish audience that is reading this, that he has intentionally lived in a place of poverty. This was also practiced by the Dead Sea Scroll community, which is part of the reason why John is often compared to them. But it was in that culture symbolic of repentance, which is what John is preaching about. So John could have also been making this political statement to challenge that religious establishment of the time, because think about them. They were the exact opposite with their robes and their wealth and their opulence. So there would have been this visual reminder of what John is saying and this reminder that God was coming to not just to judge the audience, but to judge those religious and political leaders of the time. The other thing it mentions in verse four is locusts and wild honey. And that sounds so odd for us, but this was not an unusual diet for poor people, especially people living in the desert. Locusts, this was the phase of the grasshopper that, that it took on when it was migrating. And so the grasshopper was in the list of allowable foods for the Israelites. We learn about that back in Leviticus chapter 11. 
they were an important part of the food source back then. And they still are, honestly, in many areas of the world. And, and you know, this is gross, but I have spent some time doing some mission work in New York City. And there are even some restaurants in New York City that offer this kind of protein, this grasshopper bug protein is a, you know, keto, whatever, you know, protein source. But for us, it sounds really, really gross. But for them, it was understood like, oh, not just is he wearing the clothes of intentional poverty, but he's eating the food of intentional poverty. So grasshoppers were a source of protein. They were abundant in areas that had difficult weather, like the desert, and they would often dry them and grind them into a flour. So they would get protein and just a little bit of fat from the, from the locusts or the grasshoppers, and they would get the sugar from the honey. That's all John ate. I want to make that clear. That's not just part of his diet. That's all he ate. And, you know, if I think about different seasons in my own life, when we were poor growing up, there was a handful of foods. That's all we ate because that's all we could afford. In some countries, it's beans and rice. That's all they eat because it's all they could afford. And so it's it's a very similar strategy that he's using intentionally to talk about this intentional poverty as a servant of God. These descriptions of John, what he wore and what he ate, it's Matthew's way of showing his readers that John was living simply. That was the lifestyle that God had called him to. And Matthew's making this point that he believed that God was calling some of the disciples to that same kind of standard, letting go of the things of the world and exchanging them for the things of the kingdom. Now, does that mean I think we should all give up our steak and go eat locusts? No, and I'm not going to be doing that anytime soon. But I do think it gets to the heart of an important principle that calls us to examine our own hearts to see what we're chasing after. Are we chasing after the indulgent lifestyles that require us to be slaves to our work or to our finances? Or is our focus on building the kingdom more than we're building our wallets? Just some food for thought for you today. And then the final point I want to make is in verse six, where it talks about the Jordan River. Getting baptized in the River Jordan was symbolic of how the Israelites entered into the promised land. So what John is doing is he's calling them to repent in a way that prepared for the entrance to the kingdom of God, which is the true promised land. So we see this as a metaphor, but it was an intentional choice. Again, what we see throughout this passage, these were intentional choices by John the Baptist. And to the original readers of this passage, it would have been very clear that it was a way to connect this first century expectation that they had that the Messiah was coming to rule Jerusalem. And then it was also this act of baptism itself. It was part of this Hebrew idea around purification, purification of their bodies, their hearts, their spirits, and their minds. So that's a lot that we packed into six verses, but I I hope and I pray that as I explain some of those things that you can not look at John as this wild, crazy person, but as a servant of God that really was hoping to lay this foundation and prepare the way for this messianic tension that was coming on the scene where people's hearts and minds would be prepared. So given that insight, I'm going to go back and I'm going to reread our passage for today. Starting in verse one in chapter three. Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah, the prophet, when he said, the voice of one calling out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight. Now, John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. At that time, Jerusalem was going out to him and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word and the way that you make yourself known to us through it. God, we thank you for just the way that you prepare the hearts and the minds and the spirits of people so that when they are exposed to you, they are receptive to you. Lord, I pray that even right now, as we're reading about the hearts of the Israelites, as they are getting prepared for the Messiah, Lord, would you prepare our hearts 
prepare our hearts for the things that you want to teach us through this study, for the things that by your spirit, through your word, you want to teach us and, and reveal to us, God. And, and I also pray for my friends right now that may be feeling the tension of this already and not yet. We know that you have already defeated sin on the cross. We know that you have already empowered us with the Holy Spirit, but we do not yet live in that redeemed and restored world. God, as believers, we feel this tension of knowing that the job is done, but not seeing it fulfilled. God, would you give us peace to live in that place? And that when we feel that tension, help it to prompt us to share you as we seek to know you and make you known. God, I pray for a blessing over my friends today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow, guys. 